Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Welcome uh, to our uh, program of partnership with the Jewish Book Council. This evening, I am very excited to welcome um, my colleague, Rabbi Laura Geller, um, to us. Rabbi Geller is the author of this great book, Getting Good at Getting Older. And um, I know some of you have already seen it. Um, some of you are going to be, ah, Janice already has her copy. Oh, and so does Bela. That's awesome. So uh, yes, Rabbi Geller, we definitely want to sign book plates. We'll, we'll tell you how many later. Um, if you aren't familiar with, um, with Rabbi Geller, let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, Rabbi Geller is the uh, Rabbi Emerita at Temple Emmanuel of Beverly Hills. And um, she was the director, before that she was the director of the Hillel at USC for 14 years. She was the executive director of the Pacific Southwest region of the American Jewish Congress for four years. Um, she is um, one of the great uh, rabbis of her generation. And uh, uh, those of us who call her col colleague count ourselves as proud and fortunate. Um, I could go on and on about all of the great things that Rabbi Geller has done. She was on the editorial board of, uh, of the Torah Women's Commentary. And for those of you who come on Friday nights, you know that that particular commentary, uh, which was uh, co-edited by my thesis advisor, uh, Rabbi and Dr. Andrea Weiss, is my favorite commentary um, and commentary and just generally of choice. Um, she's a fellow um, on the, the board of Brown University from where she gra graduated um, once upon a time. And, um, and she was the third woman in the reform movement to be uh, ordained a rabbi. Um, and uh, that in itself is an incredibly impressive um, fact. So much more I could share, but you really don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from Rabbi Geller. Um, Rabbi, it's such a privilege and an honor to have you with us. And uh, I know all of us look forward to learning from you. And so I will turn things over to you. And I'm also going to spotlight you so that we can all uh, see you better. So first of all, thank you so much for inviting me not only into your community, but also into your homes. And it's uh, wonderful to be your colleague and uh, the wonderful work that you do in your congregation and also for our movement and through the Women's Rabbinic Network. So almost 50 years ago, when I was an undergraduate, there was a revolution taking place in the Jewish world. I wasn't active in creating the revolution, but it's part of the reason I ended up going to rabbinical school in 1971. That revolution was energized by the beginning of the Jewish counterculture. And it was captured a few years later by a book that was modeled after the whole earth catalog, which was called the Jewish catalog, a do-it-yourself kit. Now, some of you may remember it. Here's what it looked like. Can you all see this? Yes? It empowered that generation of baby boomers, as the introduction to it said, to take back Judaism from the staid hands of our elders and reshape it for our own times. And it offered the tools to take responsibility for our own Jewish lives. Some of you might even have used the challah recipe in it the first time you ever tried to bake challah. The co-author of that book was my late husband, Richard Siegel. I didn't know him then. We got married years later. That was the 60s and 70s. And now some of us are in our 60s and 70s. Rich felt that we needed another do-it-yourself kit to help us navigate the changes that are part of our lives as we grow older. So that's the first origin story of this book, Getting Good at Getting Older. And you notice that it looks a little bit like that Jewish catalog, right? Same size, same colors, same design inside. And like the Jewish catalog, Getting Good at Getting Older is a toolkit and it has a sense of humor. The book includes irreverent cartoons and some photographs, including my favorite, which is the backside of Maxine Menster's tombstone in Iowa. It's a recipe for cookies. Apparently, every time someone asked for her cookie recipe, she would say, over my dead body. The book was published a year ago, but of course, that was really a lifetime ago before the plague, 
before people in our age cohort were afraid that we would not have the opportunity to get good at getting older. The world has completely changed. And yet the issues the book deals with are more relevant than ever. Ironically, now, because of the pandemic, all the issues that are part of our lives are more urgent. First is the reality of ageism, institutional ageism, the only acceptable ism in our society. Nice people don't make stereotypical comments about any other group of people, but a lot of people do about older people. All those negative stereotypes that we know so well, you know, those home hallmark cards, you're not losing it. You're just not using it anymore or other cards like that. Institutional ageism is real. Many of us know how hard it is for active older adults to take, be taken seriously as we want to look for new jobs or even serious volunteer opportunities in some cases. All of that is real, but also and equally important is the issue of internalized ageism, the negative stereotypes that we have of ourselves. Many of us say 70 is the new 50. That's just a way of denying that we're getting older. But now, all of a sudden, even those of us who denied that we were getting older, well, we can't do that anymore because now it's actually a frightening time to be an older adult. Frightening because people over 60 are particularly vulnerable. You know, and in addition to that, the response to the pandemic reveals that these stereotypes and ageist attitudes about boomers and those of us beyond persist and in some ways have gotten worse. I don't know if you remember, but at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a trending meme on social media, hashtag boomer remover, a morbid attitude among some that the deaths of active older adults doesn't matter. It's okay if older people are the ones who are dying. So there's real issues and in intergenerational tension. And yet, at the same time, this is a new intergenerational moment. The higher vulnerability of those of us over 60 to the virus has confronted our adult children with perhaps their first serious encounter with the health challenges that their parents or grandparents face. You know, and until now, many boomers' efforts to stay and act young delayed the arrival of concerns about health and about slowing down. But now it's our children who worry about us and fear the possibility of carrying the virus to us even if they don't have any symptoms. So some of us now, because of the pandemic, are beginning to acknowledge our internalized ageism. And we're beginning to admit that we might need help. I couldn't have gotten through the beginning of the pandemic if my stepdaughter didn't shop for me before it felt safe to go to uh, supermarkets. And now in LA, things are so bad that it doesn't feel safe to go to supermarkets anymore. I need a younger generation. I need my stepdaughter. My kids live far away. I need to admit that I might need help. And I also need to admit that there are important conversations that we should be having with our adult children about mortality. Many of us know people who have died from this virus. And at the same time, many adult children have moved back to their parents' homes, sometimes bringing grandchildren with them. So the value and possibilities of intergenerational connections have never been more clear you know, as Jews, we often think about intergenerational connections as Lador Vador, from generation, us, to generation, the younger generation. We share our wisdom with them. But now we realize that the maybe a better way to capture that is door vador, generations with generations. So one of our questions is how can we capitalize on this new reality to imagine different kinds of multi-generational possibilities after the pandemic is over? Now, in my conversations with your rabbi, I have a sense that you guys are way ahead of lots of other congregations. 
because of the community that your congregation represents, the sense of family, and the sense of family that transcends biological families, but that you are engaged with different generations in the synagogue. That doesn't happen in every synagogue across the country. The third way in which the pandemic has increased the focus on the issues that matter to us is attention to loneliness and isolation in our age cohort and in other age cohorts as well. And we all know that loneliness and isolation is only made worse by having to shelter at home. But it's important to remember that before there was COVID, there was another epidemic, a public health crisis the epidemic of loneliness. Other countries have acknowledged this. The United Kingdom actually has a minister of loneliness, a person whose job it is to think about social policy and how it can be changed in order to make isolation and loneliness less of a problem. Dr. Vivek Murthy, a former US Surgeon General who's now part of President Biden's team said before the epidemic, Loneliness and social isolation are associated with a reduction in lifespan similar to that of smoking 15 cigarettes a day and even greater than that associated with obesity. This was before the pandemic. A couple of weeks ago in the New York Times, there was an article that um, reported that researchers have begun to find signals in the brain that put the need for social interaction on par with the need to eat. In a study that was published in November, scientists deprived participants of contacts with other people and then scanned their brains. After just 10 hours of isolation in a lab where they could read or draw but had no access to phones or computers, people reported feeling lonely and craving social interaction. When they then looked at pictures of people engaged in social activities, scans showed that midbrain activation identical to that of people who looked at pictures of food after 10 hours of fasting. So social interaction isn't just something that's kind of fun or comforting, it's actually something that we need in order to function. Without social connection, people become depressed, Chronic loneliness is also linked to higher rates of heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, suicide, and even death. A fourth issue that has emerged because of the pandemic is the importance of technology. Many of us are new to the technology that's been so life-sustaining during this crisis. But at least for me, those instructional YouTube videos and webinars, they're often sort of intimidating and frustrating and maybe even exacerbates the isolation that already exists. The pandemic has put at the center of our consciousness how we need to use technology to stay connected and not just Zoom, WhatsApp, social media, intentional reaching out to old friends, regular buddy calls by using the telephone, but technology and how it's going to, how it's changed our life and it's going to continue to change our life. It's a double-edged sword. Clearly there are benefits, right? But there's also some evidence of a loneliness paradox where tech and social media that should make us more socially connected actually increase loneliness. I'm sure you all know as I do about Zoom fatigue and the challenges and blessings of Zoom life cycle events. Anyone who's ever attended a virtual funeral or a wedding knows that this is so much better than nothing. And in some ways it's quite extraordinary because you can have people on a shiva call from all over the world. But at the same time, you need a hug. You need to go back to someone's house after a funeral and be able to eat together. According to one survey, virtual social gatherings failed to reduce loneliness among 48% of the people who were surveyed and actually increased loneliness among 10% of respondents. So one of the questions for all of us, your congregation and our Jewish world and our secular world, how will we live in a pandemic, in a hybrid world when the pandemic is over? What will be the trade-offs? What will be the blessings? What will be the decisions that we make in each of our communities? 
So the book came out a year ago, October, which as I said, was a lifetime ago. So I wanna tell you the second reason that Rich and I wrote the book. I was 62, I'm 70 now, and I was beginning to think about the next stage for me and Rich. And I noticed that huge percentage of our congregants were boomers. Many were leaving the congregation. That observation led to a listening campaign where we talked to 250 congregants in people's homes, led by congregants who had gone through a facilitation training. And we asked people, how do you feel about this stage of your life? This stage between maturity, when you built your families and your careers and frail old age. It turns out that this is a new stage of life. It didn't exist for our grandparents. We're actually living approximately 30 years longer than people were a century ago, thanks to advances in medicine, education, and science. But the point is that these years are not tacked on to the end of our life, but in the middle, between midlife and frail old age. Again, a whole life stage that our grandparents never experienced. So we asked people in, this, um, in these uh, house meetings, now that more years have been added to your life, how do you add more life to your years? And we asked people, what keeps you up at night? What gets you up in the morning? What are your fears? What are your hopes? Another question that we asked that I'd like to ask you is, what do you call this stage? This stage between midlife and frail old age. What do, you, what do you call yourself? What are the words that you are comfortable with? Uh, I'm gonna take a look at all of you um, in the gallery view. How many of you like the word seniors? Raise your hand. Do I see anybody having your hand up? How many of you don't like the word senior? Okay. Uh, Rabbi, can you call on one who likes it and one who doesn't so we can hear why? Absolutely. Okay. Who wants to talk in favor of uh, liking being called a senior? Just raise your hand so I can. Okay. Nancy, Nancy, Arnie, Arnie Sutcher, I'll call on you. Truly, one of my favorite Alta Cockers. Un unmute yourself, my friend. <laughs> You're muted. You're muted. It's better than being called an Alta Cocker. <laughs> I just did. Okay. So, Artie, why do you like being called a senior? Answer again. Sorry. Because I made it. <laughs> okay. It. This is good. I don't have very strong feelings about it. Okay. Bela, why don't you also answer? Why do you like, why are you okay with senior? Well, first of all, I was a director of a senior center and we went through a whole big thing there about what they wanted to be called. Uh, you know, when I, I, I think even when I first started there, I was already probably, uh, I was a little younger. The seniors were considered a senior by the city at age 60, and I was probably in my late 50s. But um, I don't really, it's, I don't really find it pejorative. It's just, a th you know, you are senior to other people in life. It doesn't really bother me. And, you know, given the, the other things that people <laughs> <laughs> to be called a senior is okay. I mean, you know, I was a senior in high school. I didn't mind it then. I don't mind being, it's, a, it just, a, it's like sort of meaningless to me. That's really why it's not that so much that I like it, but I don't dislike it. It just, it's just like nothing. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a person of a certain age. And at that age, if you want to call me a senior, rather than say a person of a certain age, go ahead. I don't really care. Okay, good. Who, somebody who doesn't like it. Is there somebody who doesn't like being called a senior who wants to raise their hand? Judy Epstein. Okay. So now that I'm finally probably past being middle-aged, I let people call me middle-aged. But to me, senior is somebody who's got white hair, mine's only gray, and bent over a cane, which is only me part of the time. So I'm not ready. <laughs> Okay, so we see that this is a word that has mixed uh, associations, right? Um, I personally liked those senior discounts in the olden days when there were still movies that you could go to, and I look forward to when that happens again. But still, it's a kind of mixed, mixed word. Um, how many of you like the word elder? Would like to be called an elder? Anybody? I, Sally, Sally's saying that she she 
She's raising her hand. My mom is vehemently saying no. Okay. But Sally, why, uh, Sally, unmute yourself. Why do you like being called an elder? Or why is that okay with you? I, I think that's probably from my Quaker background uh -huh. where the older people in the Quaker church were called the elders um, because I suppose that they assumed that the elders had more wisdom than the younger people. Mm -hmm. it, it was a positive accolade to be called an elder. So th this is very, very interesting because in many religious traditions, including Judaism, by the way, elders were venerated, right? So you would think that that would be a status that we would aspire toward. But in fact, it's a mixed word. Somebody who doesn't like it? Anyone who doesn't want to, who doesn't like being called an elder, who wants to give a go Your at it? mother. Mom, Your you want to tell why? Unmute yourself. I feel like when, if I'm being called elder, I'm on my last leg. <laughs> I'd rather be called senior than elder. Okay, so the elder sort of has associations with elderly, and that's different from wisdom. You know, one of the things that we learned uh, as Jewish feminism became real is that if you can't name something, it's hard to know how to experience it. So even the difficulty of naming this stage becomes part of the um, world in which we live that we need to think about. Um, what are we? Uh, some of us are boomers and we're often called boomers, but we all know that boomers is a technical term that identifies a particular generation of people who were born between 1946 and 1964. Some of us on this call are boomers, some of us are not boomers. So the word boomer, it doesn't really necessarily relate to us. And the other thing that's really important for us to notice is we are creating a new life stage. Someday, those of us who have children, um, our millennial children will be between the ages of 60 and 85 in, the, you know, in, this, in this unnamed state. And how we figure out what it is and how to do it is going to be important for the generations that come after us. So what are some of the other words that people uh, um, explore? Um, retired, but that only works if you work, then you're not working anymore. Rewired, seasoned. Seasoned. This, this is the third chapter. This is the encore generation. Um, actually, my favorite is a word that was uh, chosen by Dr. Laura Karstensen of the Stanford Center on Longevity. She calls us perennials, still blooming, still full of life. Some years not so good, some years better, but perennial. So that's, a, I think, a, a, an interesting and good take uh, on what this stage might be. Um, it's also important to, to specifically remind us that this is not a chronological age. We're talking about a new life stage. And in this life stage, we're different. Some of us are healthy and still very active. Others wrestle with physical challenges, with disabilities, with illness, with caregiving. Some of us are parents of adult children and grandchildren. Some of us don't have kids or grandchildren or don't have the kinds of connections with them that we wish we had. Some of us are solo agers. Some of us have partners. Some of us have discretionary resources and some of us worry about financial future. It's important to notice that although we have much in common in this new life stage, we're still a diverse group and we need to see people as the individuals they are. So back to the listening campaign, people shared their fears and there were four fears. The first fear was becoming invisible. Who am I when I'm no longer the senior rabbi of, Beverly, of Temple Emanuel of Beverly Hills? The second fear was being isolated. You know, friends are moving away. Who's my community? The third was being without purpose what do I do all day? And the fourth, being dependent. God forbid I should ever be dependent, especially on my children. So those were the fears, again, becoming invisible, becoming isolated, being without purpose, 
and being dependent. And then people shared questions. How do I navigate changing relationships with older parents, with millennial children, with intimate partners, and in particular with friends? How do I nurture long-term connections? How do I let go of toxic friendships? Now that I know that there's less time ahead than there was behind, do I still want to be involved with people who suck energy from me? And if I don't, how do I let them go? And then how do I make new friends? And then as friends move away, kids too, with whom do I want to grow old? And in what kinds of settings? Do I want to move to a retirement community? Do I want to move to be near my kids? Do I want to share my house if I'm a widow? Do I want to age in place, stay in my home? And if I do, what kinds of changes do I need to make in my community to make that possible? Then there were other questions. How do I deal with illness, my own or that of my friends? Now it's true that at many stages of our lives, we get sick, people get sick, but there's no question that more of it is now at this stage of our life. Other questions. What do I need to do to get ready for the inevitable? What are those end of life conversations that I know I need to have with my kids, but how do I have them? And if I don't have kids, with whom do I have them? Other questions, what will give meaning to my life now that I no longer work full time? How can I find a volunteer or a paid position to which I can bring my experience, my talent, my passion, my wisdom? I wanna still be useful, I wanna give back, how do I do that? And then one of my favorite questions, what do I have to do now to become the 85 year old I someday hope to be? What work do I need to do on myself now, a 70 year old, to be that 85 year old, that 90 year old, who's curious, who's joyful, who's energetic, who's optimistic, who's grateful? What work do I need to do now to grow up to be like her? And finally, there were questions about legacy. What lives on after I'm gone? So all this came out in the listening campaign and those questions became the table of contents for the book. Getting Good at Getting Older has six sections. The first is Getting Good at Gaining Wisdom. The second, Getting Good at Getting Along. The third, Getting Good at Getting Better. The fourth, Getting Good at Getting Ready. The fifth, getting good at giving back. And the sixth, getting good at giving away. And each section offers actual tools and resources that help find your own answers to questions within those categories. It's not a book that you read from beginning to end. It's not a sermon. It's a book that deals with the kinds of issues that we deal with at this stage of our life. So I learned some surprising things in the process of writing the book. The first thing I learned was how important friends are as we get older. It turns out that in 1993, Betty Friedan, you remember her, it's her 100th birthday coming up now, the anniversary of her 100th birthday. Um, she wrote a book called The Fountain of Age. And she was actually one of the first people to write a book about this stage. And here's what she wrote. More and more, psychologists have found that for older persons, loneliness is not necessarily linked to the death of a spouse or to how infrequently they see their children or grandchildren, but to the absence of personal relationships with peers, friends of their own age or any age who share their interests and with whom they sustain their roots of shared experience. So friendship is really important at this stage of our life. And again, in talking with your rabbi, it sounds like this is something that you all really understand and have used this wonderful congregation of yours to build those kinds of friendships. Again, you're lucky. Other people don't necessarily have those mediating institutions like a good synagogue to help do it. But even so, I think that it's important for us as Jews to recognize that if we take friendship seriously, we need to acknowledge that our tradition needs to change when it thinks about who is a mourner. Technically, as you know, a mourner is someone who is a parent, a child, a sibling, or a spouse. 
And when a rabbi meets with a family to talk about a funeral, those are the voices that are in the funeral. But the truth is that friends, particularly longtime friends, are also mourners. And they're pretty invisible in Jewish tradition. Now, if you, God forbid, were to lose somebody in the congregation that everybody knew, you could all mourn together. But if one of you has a really good friend who lives in Los Angeles that you've known since you were a little kid, and that person dies, you are also a mourner. But how do you acknowledge that in your community in New York? I think this is something that we need to think about and take seriously as we really value the importance of friendship. A second thing I learned that surprised me is how few people have shared their end of life wishes with anyone beyond their doctor. In my congregation, Temple Emanuel of Beverly Hills, the majority of folks had end of life directives and an incredibly small percentage had ever really talked to their adult children. Now, every rabbi has the experience of sitting in a hospital room when a beloved mom or not so beloved mom or dad are no longer able to communicate their wishes and adult children disagree about what would be what mom or dad wanted. Those kinds of conflicts, that kind of toxicity is brutalizing and leads to all kinds of horrible things in families. And it could be so easily uh, prevented if we could have these conversations with all the people in the room long before it's necessary so that everybody knows what mom or dad wants. The third thing I learned that um, was really important to me is that Jewish tradition really does have wisdom as we negotiate this stage. If I wanna be that 85 year old, what are the things I need to work on? All of the studies say you need to work on gratitude. You need to work on forgiveness. You need to work on equanimity. And it turns out there is a spiritual practice in our tradition called Musar, um, the cultivation of character traits that actually helps a person develop those muscles. I could be doing that Musar work now so that when I'm 85, I become that person. Um, or all of the other um, practices that our tradition offers to help us really work on who we want to be as we grow older. But another thing emerged for me, and that was the power of ritual. Now, if you think about it, our tradition believes in the power of ritual and blessings. The Talmud tells us that everybody is supposed to say a hundred blessings a day. That means a hundred times a day you stop and you say, wow, wow. You know, you eat a meal that has bread, you say a mozi. It's basically a way of stopping and saying, wow. Or you eat an apple and you actually traditionally need to know where it grows because the blessing is specific. Did it grow on a tree? Did it grow in the ground? You see the ocean you haven't seen for a long time, you say a blessing. Out here, a blessing that you need to know is that there's a blessing for an earthquake. And what that blessing is says a lot about how you think about your place in the universe and about the earthquake. And our tradition offers us life cycle ceremonies, marking tradition, marking transitions from one stage of life to another. So what are those life cycle rituals? Well, a baby is born and there's a bris or there's a covenant ceremony. By the way, when I started rabbinical school, there weren't yet covenant ceremonies for girls. It, you know, the first one was published in 1972. Um, then comes a pidyon haben, a redemption of the firstborn son, or a redemption of the firstborn child, or sometimes for Reformed Jews, not any kind of redemption ceremony. Then there's a bar or a bat mitzvah. Then there's confirmation. Then there's a wedding. Maybe there's a divorce. And then what is the life cycle ritual that happens after a wedding or a divorce? What's the next one that Jewish tradition has? Anybody? Well, children were being born. Okay, children are being born is a good answer, but that's not exactly a ritual. Funeral? A funeral. The next life cycle ritual after a wedding is a funeral. 
Now the answer, well, what about our children? That's a really good answer. And that is what the traditional answer would be. We don't need rituals for this stage of our life because we're reliving these moments in our children and in our grandchildren. And that's, I think, a coherent answer, but it's not a sufficient one for me because first of all, what if you don't have children or grandchildren? And what about all those parts of our lives where we are more than just a mom or a grandma? What are the other moments in our lives at this stage that I would want to say, wow, wow, good, wow, bad, but wow, something important is happening. Um, ironically, I am, God willing, going to live more years between my first wedding and my funeral than between when I was born and my first wedding. What are the moments at this stage of our lives that we might want to mark with ritual in some way? So um, let's take a moment and ask, um, what might those be? Um, and have any of you ever created a ritual or thought of a ritual for a moment? in this stage of life. Oops. Anybody? Okay, so you can either raise your hand or you can put it in the chat box. Mom, did you have your hand raised? Yes, what about anniversaries, special anniversaries? Okay, good, special anniversaries. That's My, one. Milestone moments. Okay. What about particular ages like 75? Okay. Great, okay, there, there is a tradition, by the way, that when you're 83, you celebrate another bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah, or if you never had one in the first place, why? Because the Psalmist says a person's life is 70, and if you make it to 83, it's as though you were 13, and so it's a time for acknowledging that, and very often that ritual looks a little like a bar mitzvah, and often it happens in a synagogue. One of the interesting questions as we imagine new ritual is where does it happen? How many of these might be things that you would do in your synagogue? How many of these things are things that you might want to do with a different friendship group in your own home? You know, the book raises this question and it asks you to think about what are the moments in your life that you might want to mark with ritual. And then it gives you a, a way of thinking about how to create those kinds of moments. So while you think about what some of those other moments might be, I want to read just a very short excerpt from the book. Um, it's called Farewell Family Home. This was written by a congregant uh, of mine at uh, Temple Emmanuel. Saying goodbye to the house where you raised your children isn't easy, but it's easier if you actually say goodbye. Our daughter, her boyfriend, my husband and I walk through the rooms of our home stopping in each one to share good memories and to honor the room for its service. After the journey through time, space, and love, we shed a few tears, toasted the house, and sent it on its way to shelter and protect a new family. Before this ritual, we were stuck, painfully holding on to the house we had built 27 years before when our daughter was born. But after the ritual, we felt joy and contentment as we realized how rich those years had been and how ready we were to let go and move on. An unforeseen benefit is that our daughter's boyfriend now feels more connected to the life and history of our family and says he can't wait to be part of the new memories we make together in our condo. We can't wait either. And subsequent to the book being published, they did make a new memory in their condo. Um, I was there. I was the rabbi at the wedding of that boyfriend and girlfriend. Masked. They were masked. And the mom and dad were masked. And it happened, you know, in increments of six feet apart in the new condo um, where, where the family moved. So that's an example of taking a moment that actually, you know, could make a real difference about what it means when you move out of the home where you raised your children. Um, other kinds of moments like that, okay, you know, the, the thing that actually started me thinking about all this is um, at one point I get a call from a congregant, uh, Rabbi, uh, my brother and I are on our way to um, dismantle our mother's home. We're moving her to a nursing home. Um, what's the prayer you say when you dismantle your mother's home. And I said, yes, there should be a prayer, right? 
there should be a prayer. And we came up with something and saying the prayer transformed what would have been a chore into what they came to experience as a um, sacred moment. So what are those other moments? Any thoughts, any other ideas that you have? Okay, I'm gonna give everyone about a minute or 30 seconds to think about it. And then I'm gonna start calling on you. So be ready. Um, I know some of you have been through some major milestone moments that um, are worth celebrating or marking in some ways. So um, Bela, what's something that you, you think you'd do? No, you just muted yourself. Me. Yeah, okay. Bela. Here we go. I, I, becoming a grandparent. Right. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's very that's a good moment. Okay, so already we noticed that there are different. It happens in different ways, right? If you're fortunate enough to become a grandparent with a grandchild who's right there in the community where you live, that's one experience of grandparenting. If you like me have grandchildren that live in Portland and you live in Los Angeles, I was transformed by becoming a grandparent, but my friendship circle didn't get to celebrate that with me because my kids are not here. What is, how do I become a grandparent here? Acknowledge that tran transformation here with the people that mean something to me here when the grandkids are there. It's an interesting question, you know. Um, you, uh, I mean, a lot of us, if we're lucky, are becoming grandparents. What would it mean at the synagogue to like figure out what to do, how to market, how you can be helpful to each other? How, you know, what does it mean to be a grandparent to a kid that lives far away? How do you do that well? Some of us have figured it out, some of us haven't. It'd be good to kind of share that stuff. Um, so I, an important, good moment. Arlene Levinson. Well, I was, I was going to say also becoming a grandparent, but also becoming a parent um, and retirement. Okay. Okay, so becoming a parent, many of us do that earlier in our lives. Um, one of the things about being a parent of millennial children, when they move away, you know, what's the ritual for that? I mean, for some of follow, us- Follow them. Follow them. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, notice the answer to that question, which is a good answer. So the first question is, with whom do you want to grow old? Do you want to move to where they are? Um, and, and if not, you know, how do you mark that? I mean, one of the really powerful images of our tradition or, or rituals is Havdalah, separation, where you take the sweetness of Shabbat and move into the rest, the rest of the week. You know, a kid moves away, um, sadness, but also a lot of joy. Can you, how will you use the metaphor of Havdalah to help mark that kind of a transition? Um, it's an interesting question. Is that something that you do at a synagogue? Is it something that you do at home? Is it something you just do with your kids? But it's something to pay attention to. Our tradition says, stop and say, wow, something important is happening. Um, so um, what else? Uh, Mena Bobek, did you unmute yourself? Mena? Can I? Yes. Can you yeah. hear me? Yes. Uh, I want to do a general comment since I'm looking forward to other things. But I found that when I was 60, I had tragedy, 70, 80. And now I'm going on, this year I'll be going on my 90th year. But each year and each decade, I should say, I was very different. I faced everything differently and I adapted to it because I'm very happy now. I'm very happy with myself. Every day to me is wonderful. Everything I do during the day is wonderful. And I bless myself because I have all these things, not only <laughs> Sally and Stu and you, but I have my son and I have many good things. But going into 90, the only thing I can say about it is that um, I feel better about myself. I feel better about things. I'm very calm. I know what, what tragedy is. One of the hardest part, as you know, Rabbi, was when my friends died. My longtime friends died and my brother died. 
I, I would say that is the hardest part. And, and, and you're right, you're right, Rabbi Gala. Uh, losing your friends, you're also losing your past and the happiness that you, you're, you're gypped, actually, of going, saying to your friend, oh, remember this, remember that, or doing that. So when you lose your friends and your, your, your siblings, it, it's extremely hard. But just like you did the rest of your life, you pick yourself up, you brush yourself off, and you start all over again. So I want, to, I want to grow up to be like you. What do I need to do? Now? It's hard. It's not no, easy. Really, I, I believe it. And I mean, but so what you're saying is, you know, loss is real, right? Um, it turns out as hard as it is for many of us during this pandemic, especially I think for people who are alone, um, you know, we tend to be doing better than younger people because we're more resilient. Why? Because we know this too shall pass. We've been through hard times before. Right. And you know that you need to move forward. So the question is, how can ritual help you move forward in ways that are meaningful? So I'm just going to give you a couple of other examples. Um, out here in Los Angeles, driving is a very big deal. And a very difficult moment is when a person needs to give up the car keys. And mostly it is experienced as tremendous loss and also shame. What would it be like if we could reframe that with some kind of a ritual that people who are wise enough to know when it's time for them to stop driving, that we could honor them in some way, that the synagogue does something that says, whoa, you guys are wise. And then because it's public, the synagogue or the community or whatever makes a commitment to make it possible for them to still get around, right? If this is a public ceremony, then the synagogue is obligated to figure out how, they, how they're going to get to show if they don't drive anymore. So these rituals, if we took them seriously and really worked on them together as a community, would not only be transformative for us and our families, but could also transform our relationships to the institutions that matter to us, in your case, to, to the synagogue. Um, I want to just move on a little bit and just say a few more words, unless somebody else wants to say something about ritual. Minna, do you want to, did you have one more? Mom. One more. Minna, just Minna one thing. Ma, my my ritual every night is I go to the mezuzah and I think of three to four to five good things that happened to me or that I did during the day. And then I know life is great. That is That's so how I go on. That is a really Jewish spiritual practice, that practice of gratitude. And to do it connected to the mezuzah is particularly lovely. One of the things that we write about in the book is, is um, the um, practice of a, of a gratitude journal, where every night before you go to bed, you write down three things that you're grateful for in the day. It's, it's another example of what you're doing, but that's a practice. And in doing it, you are um, exercising the gratitude muscle so that it gets stronger and more able to sustain you um, as you grow older. So that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful sharing, and um, it's a Jewish spiritual practice. Mom, you had a quick comment. Yes, quick. We renewed our vows after 25 years. And the other thing I wanted to say was grateful one of the things that you do on friday nights is sweet things and i think that's one of the things that you're grateful for all the sweet things that happen to you during the week things so that, yes that, every week after, you do in the congregation yes every every week after at the end of shabbat services we take a moment to share something sweet from the week and anyone who wants to share and um and, and it's really, you know, it's been a great way for our congregation, you know, and to connect and to know what's going on in each other's lives. Right. So that's really beautiful that you do that. And, you know, it's not only about the person sharing what, having to notice that there were sweet things, even in a difficult week. But at the same time, if one of our fears is becoming invisible, the idea that we can say in the presence of a community this happened and it matters, I'm not invisible anymore. And that is so important. So that in itself is a huge gift of being part of your congregation. 
Well, let me just say the last thing that came up um, that um, didn't surprise me exactly, but I think it's important to say, and that is the question of legacy. How we want to be remembered becomes more important. And one of the things that the book does, and this stage of our lives does, is encourage us to begin to think about what our legacy is um, and how we leave a legacy. So there are four ways that we leave a legacy. One is through our money. Some of us have a lot of money and we leave money, but all of us are Jewish, so we're leaving some money. We all give tzedakah, thinking about not just doing it um, thoughtlessly, but you know, what are the things that matter to you that you want to be supporting through whatever money you're gonna leave behind? The second thing, is our stuff. Now I have only one thing to say that is actually bad news. And that is our kids don't want our stuff. What are we gonna do with our stuff? How you think about stuff and giving away things that have value to us that maybe our children or our, you know, whoever we might leave things to don't really want. That becomes a really important issue and um, something for us to talk about. The third is our stories. Many of us wish that we knew more stories about our parents and grandparents. We are still in a position to tell those stories so that generations that come after us will know. How do you leave those stories? What are the different modalities? The book is quite specific about ways to do that. And finally, our values. How do you make clear what the values are that you want to leave behind? You can say, well, if people don't know what my values are now, it's not worth, but the fact is thinking about values, particularly the way Jewish tradition encourages us to do it, helps us sort of recalibrate as I imagine writing an ethical will and what it is that I would wanna to say to, let's say my children. It makes me ask myself, well, how am I doing on those things? And maybe I need to pay a little more attention to something. Um, so the whole tradition of writing ethical wills, which begins in the Bible and continues all the way through Jewish tradition until the contemporary period is something also about legacy. So um, let's take a moment and um, let me ask you how you are dealing with the stuff question. Does anybody have any uh, interesting um, strategies? Rabbi Geller, I just wanna say on behalf of all children everywhere, I want to agree with you and say, we don't want your stuff. <laughs> and um, and my congregation knows that my parents just sold their house. Um, it's it's almost the year anniversary of them selling their house. And um, but what we do want is your stories. So um, so it is a really interesting question. And I you know and I would say I know from talking to so many people in my beloved congregation that. Um, my parents and I are not the only one who had this struggle with what to do because there are so many memories attached to, to the things in your home. And, um, and then there's also, you know, that sense of they, they are valuable. You know, I got this from my, um, so I'm just wondering what else, how other people, you know, just to echo Rabbi Geller's question, um, what are you doing with that stuff? Judy, and then, uh, and then the fetter lines. Well, it's not what I'm doing, but it's my plan. Um, to connect the stuff with the story. So when I used to visit my husband's grandmother, she would pick up the tchotchka and tell me how it came into her life. And sometimes I wanted the tchotchka for itself and sometimes I took it anyway for her sake, but most of them are only important because of the story, whether you realize that or not. And so sometimes like if nobody's around and I'm I might just say, this has the following story, do with it as you like, but at least I will have given them the story. So I think that that is a really good strategy. And in fact, the book outlines how you think about that. But the question is, where are those stories? Are they written down? Not yet. <laughs> okay, so, so, I mean, I'll tell you a quick story. I grew up in Boston. My grandmother, my grandparents lived around the corner. There was a hutch, a big cabinet. I remember it from when I was a little girl in my grandmother's house. And uh, when I moved to uh, Los Angeles, you know, more than 40 years ago, I 
wanted something of my grandmother's. So we sent the hutch across the country. It's in my living room. It's beautiful. It's antique. My kids don't want it. <laughs> you know, what am I going to do with it? It's not something you put on the sidewalk and have, you know, the sanitation department pick up. And I realized in thinking about it that it isn't the hutch because just as you said, it's my grandmother. Mm -hmm. I, I love that hutch because I loved my grandmother. And so what we did is we took a picture of the hutch and I told the story and wrote it down. And so my kids have in their computer somewhere a picture of the hutch and they have the story and they know about my grandmother. And I will, when I, I'm not in this house anymore, I will donate this hutch to a family who will love it and then be able to pass it on in, in some similar kind of way. So thinking about that is um, really an important thing, but you don't want to wait until you're not around to uh, help them decide. Um, <laughs> Maybe I do. <laughs> well, so, I mean, but that's also interesting to notice, you know, and, and uh, um, there are some congregations that actually have decluttering groups to help think this through, you know, is that something that would be useful? Is that something that uh, enough of you share in common that you could kind of, come up with some strategies and share them. Um, something to think about. Nancy and Jerry, you have your, your hands up. Well, I was thinking about this as you were talking and we're sitting in our den here and, and it's filled with stuff. Uh, but a lot, some of the stuff have significant experiences, at least to us, connected with them. And at this uh, tender senior eldest stage of my life, I enrolled in a writing class this past fall because I was thinking about putting together a scrapbook of, of things that I've written over the years uh, that very much experience based. And one of the uh, essays that I wrote just a couple of months ago was I picked on a, a couple of pieces of stuff in the den here, but I, I worked it around the experience of acquiring that stuff. And you know, our children know about it, perhaps, but the grandchildren don't. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of, of, in my mind, of connecting stuff with the experience of having that stuff. And maybe that would provide some better meaning to the, uh, to the family or particularly the grandkids. So that's really beautiful. It is interesting that many people of this stage of our lives are actually involved in memoir classes. What are you going to do with this? Is it, are you going to turn it into a book? Are you going to put it on the community? I mean, have you thought about what you're going to do with what you're writing? Well, well the teacher of the class said that she, she's tapped into some raw talent. I'm not sure if I'd go that far about myself, but, but, uh, we, the two of us, have had some very unique experiences connected with uh, traveling and living abroad and things like that. Uh, and, and I don't necessarily fashion myself as a writer, but I do have experiences that I can share. And that's what prompted me to, uh, to try to put pen to paper so that that would be part of perhaps the legacy that will leave for the grandkids. It's the grandkids that we're focusing on. <laughs> our children become conduits to our, you know, grand, you know, the focus of, of our grandkids. So this is in effect an ethical will that you're writing this memoir because it's sharing the stories that you want to be um, remembered and that say something about who you are and what your life meant. So to, you know, one of the things that keeps us from doing this is you know, nobody's interested, who cares, my life isn't that important. But I think if any of us could have imagined what it would have been like if we had something from our grandfather or mother, right. you know, what a gift that would be. And so the notion that what we have isn't important enough to be written down is simply not true. All of us have stories and maybe we don't all have raw talent, right? But we all, uh, have stories that should be collected and, and captured in some way so that they can be passed down. Well, I think subconsciously that's probably a motivation on my part because I'm 
firstborn in this country of, of immigrant, of an immigrant family, you know, from Germany that fled the Nazis. And uh, growing up, it was, you know, the typical, the parents are trying to make their way in the new world and they don't share, right. you know, we didn't know that much. And I wanna make sure at least to the extent possible that our grandkids do know about us. So again, this is, I think, a wonderful spiritual practice. It is a Jewish spiritual practice, whether you're doing a memoir class at a Y or whether you're doing a memoir class in a congregation. But this is an important part of this stage of our life, thinking about what we're going to leave behind. And as you write, as you write this, you also think about what's important to you. So it's, as I said, a kind of recalibration of our own, you know, however much time you have left, where else do you want to travel? You know, what other, what do you learn from paying attention enough to write this down? So all of these, I think, are important pieces of what it means to get good at getting older. I just want to give a few other people, if that's okay with you, Rabbi, a few other people have been, Roberta, I see you've had your hand raised for a while, and then Marvin, I see you too. Well, thank you, Rabbi Geller. I think you were, were superb. And um, all the promotion that our rabbi gave that you were going to be wonderful, you're going to be wonderful. Um, you certainly lived up to those words. So I thank you. I feel very relieved to hear that. Thank you very much. And I'm a hard sell. So. Okay, good, good. Um, um, so first, I want to say that I feel privileged that my mom died two years ago at 93. And she was a vibrant, bright um, woman right to the end. And although she was a collector of stuff and um, it drove me crazy. And I said, you're not, you know, it was really hard for her to part with things. And when she moved into from a larger condo and from a house, I was left with that to get rid of like the rabbi had to do. And then from her Florida condo to a smaller one bedroom in a independent facility. It was a, a battle, but um, that being said, she she knew I she when she was alive. We talked about my daughter. My daughter likes old things and always did. She wanted this china collection, so I always knew my mom was in Florida. We were in New York, but I knew we were going to ship that, and my mother knew that. So certain things. I promised her, her dying words were, you know, don't, don't give away this china, her dying words, literally. Really, her man. wish to me was don't throw away this china thing. Oh, wow. I did. But other than that, you know, she, and it, it was hard, you know, cause I knew it was, um, she had tons of scrapbooks from all her trips and pictures, but she knew they were all gonna go in a dumpster. What was I gonna do with them? Mm. Plus with things, but what she did do in her eighties was write her story for my daughter. Mm. And she wrote it like in a, it started off like in a book that I bought, like a canned book for grandparents to write, mm -hmm. but then she expanded it. Mm -hmm. And so it's in a binder and, you know, like a, a spiral. So she wrote her stories and the few um, material things that she, well, the jewelry, that kind of thing, of course, but like this kind of, you know, a picture frame. So she was able to tell, she knew what we were going to take. And she also made it very clear to my brother and I what her wishes were, mm -hmm. if when, when the time, very clear. And that was also a gift. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It was such a gift because A, my brother and I didn't argue with each other. Mom wants this, no, I want that. And it wasn't about us. Mm -hmm. It was about what she said she wanted. And so that was a gift. And, um, you know, she was a great role model, and I hope I can live up to her. Well, that is, I mean, it's a wonderful story, and I think that last thing that you said is really important. I mean, she did this very well, and now the question is, how well are you going to do the equivalent thing when you are then in, in that stage? And the truth is, we're getting to be in that stage. It might be 20 years from now, but now is the time to prepare. I mean, one no, of the- I just interjected when you said, what do you want to be called a senior? Do you want to be called an elder? And so much as um, your age, 
was when I was like 56 or seven visiting in Florida. And you mentioned you like those senior discounts. And I went to the movies with my mother and they said like two seniors. And I was like mortified. I was like 56. What are you kidding me? I'm not a senior. I'm paying full price. Now I bring it on, you know. Sure. You're, not, you're not Jewish then. <laughs> but when I used to tell her, I said, I'm old, mom. I'm like 65. You know, if I was 65, I'm old. She used to say, if you're old, what am I? And I would right. say, oh, you're old, old. I'm old and you're old, old. Or the answer is you're older. Oh, you're older. You're older, right? <laughs> yeah. And the other fortunate thing is, is I guess as a reaction to her, I don't care about stuff. Like you can get rid of, it doesn't mean, it's just stuff. I don't even, it, it's okay. It's all okay. But I loved your idea about the car, like yeah. tell the community because that she didn't do well. Yeah. And she drove me crazy that I used to cry yeah. because she wouldn't give up those car keys. You're not alone. It's really a big issue, really. Oh, sorry, Roberta. I didn't mean to mute you. I, 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 sorry about that. I will say though that um, you know, with the pandemic, it does, it does kind of um, what some of my friends and I, um, since I'm in the generation of, I'll, I'll, for some of you, your kids are younger than me, but I know a lot of you, your kids are around my age, and we are in the in the generation, especially with the pandemic, and worrying about our parents, as Rabbi Geller was talking about, of saying, you know, it used to be that it was why won't our kids listen to us, and now it's kids saying. You know why won't our parents listen to us? We're really worried about them, and um, and now it's about the pandemic, and you know maybe one day it will be about driving, and those things are really you know are really difficult. We're running out of time. And I want to say I want to say one so, more thing about that. Yes, that is, I said that the fourth fear was becoming dependent. Yes, Being dependent. God forbid I should be dependent on my children, right? Yes. But the truth is, I am dependent on my children, and they are dependent on me. And I'm dependent on my friends, and I'm also independent. The trick is to not think about being dependent or independent, but understanding that getting good at getting older at any age is to understand interdependence. What does that mean? What is a nurturing interdependence? And if we get that right, then this stage of life will be filled with all kinds of opportunities and possibilities. So Rabbi, I, I, Marvin, I know I said you're, I was going to call on you, but I think we're out of time. Um, I want to be sensitive to the time. Um, but I, I want to say more, one more last thing to say, which okay, is. Okay, but I, I was going to give you a moment, but yes, go ahead. So I, I just want to say this. First of all, um, I think that Rabbi Geller has raised a lot of different issues for us that we probably want to continue talking about. And perhaps we want to continue having this conversation. And if you are interested in continu continuing the conversation, um, you know, I'm going to send something out. You can, or you can just send me an email and let me know. Um, and I'm going to send some out, but there are some really good questions that we can still talk about. And um, I don't know if I'll be the facilitator or if one of you, I'll find one of you to facilitate it. Um, but, um, but I think, you know, there are some really good conversations to be had here and, um, and this is to be continued. Um, I do want to remind you, and I, I know I'm going to, you know, give Rabbi Geller the last, the last word here, but I do want to remind you um, all of this conversation and all these comments that you like are, want to be sharing, they're because the, of, of a book <laughs> um, that, you know, that got our conversation started, getting good at getting older. And um, it's a great thing to have on your shelf. And it's a great thing to just be able to pull out and say like, how, you know, how, I, I think I want to, you know, how should I deal with this, you know, what are some things that I, you know, want to be thinking about? I loved Rabbi Geller when you talked about the idea of, you know, I want to, you know, at 70 to say, like, I want to grow up to be that 85 year old, like, what is it going to take? Like, how am I want to be become the person that I want to be at 85, you know, looking at it from the perspective of being 70. And um, so, you know, a lot of things to continue to think about. So um, Rabbi, I'm going to turn it back to you. And then I'm going to just make a couple of announcements at the end. Okay, um, you're also going to post my website. Um, yes. I'm very curious about all this stuff. So if you have more thoughts, email me. I promise to email you back, not necessarily the first day, but I, you know, so we can keep this conversation going on email. So please take that seriously as an opportunity. And I want to hear what happens in the congregation that, you know, has come out of this. So uh, you and I will keep in touch. Absolutely. 
the bottom line of the book is 70 is not the new 50. 70 is the new 70. And how we do this, how we reimagine this stage of life is very important, not just for us, not just for our families, not just for our community, but really for the world. So this matters. This really matters. People are watching how we do it and how we do it is going to change, really going to change the world. Remember tomorrow, tonight actually already is uh, um, Tu B'Shvat, the new year of the trees, right? When the sap begins to flow and in the, the tree of life, whose roots are in heaven and whose branches are connecting all of us on earth, this is the day when the divine flow begins again in earnest, right? This is a moment of real powerful connection. And it reminds me of the wonderful story in the Talmud of Pony, a miracle worker who sees an older person planting a almond tree and says, you know, why are you doing this? It's going to take 70 years for it to blossom. You're not going to be around. And the older person responds, when I came into this world, my ancestors had planted almond trees. I am planting for the next generation. You all are planting for the next generation. So my blessing for all of you is keep planting trees. Happy to Bishvat, and thank you so much for inviting me into your community. Thank you so much, Rabbi. And um, as Roberta um, Cooperman said, you did not disappoint. I know I knew you would not. And um, I look forward to continuing, you know, to our congregation and our and friends uh, um, also who are here um, to um, to continuing this conversation. And you, you know, you could see as I could see as you were talking, you know, it, you touched. Um, you touched a nerve, you know, a lot of different, you know, the good kind of ones and, and you really made us think. So um, for us to be continued and, um, and I promise that within the, the next day or so, um, you will receive an email with uh, a link, uh, an Amazon link for, uh, for Rabbi Geller's book and also the link to her website. Um, and I will be uh, publishing um, this, uh, her, this talk on, on YouTube. So if you'd like to share that with friends who might not have, you know, been able to make it tonight, but you think would be interested, um, I encourage you to do so. Just a few announcements before we, um, before we say goodnight. Um, for those of you who are um, in Port Washington or from this area, um, for whom Tom Swazi is your congressman, I want to remind you that this Monday at seven o'clock, Congressman Swazi is coming to talk to Port Jewish Center on Zoom, and you'll have the opportunity um, to, to talk with him um, and to ask any questions and just to hear, you know, his how his take on the state of politics, um, you know, on the Hill these days. And uh, it should be a really interesting conversation, and it's a great opportunity for our sweet congregation um, to meet with him. Um, also, next week is actually a big week for us in terms of adult ed. We have two speakers um, coming on, on, on Wednesday at 8 o'clock. We have Matt Goodman coming to talk about his book, The City Game. And uh, a lot of you have already read it um, and uh, I know are looking forward to it. For those of you who haven't read it um, and you just want to come, you might just want to come and hear Matt Goodman talk about his book. It's about the 1949 to 1950 uh, City College uh, basketball team and the gambling ring uh, that was all over New York City uh, and, um, and a point shaving scandal. It's completely fascinating. That basketball team was a bunch of Jewish and black kids from New York City who managed to beat, um, to win the NCAA and the NIT championships um, and beating out the University of Kentucky and, um, and, the, and the NCAA and the NIT, uh, or maybe it's reversed and, and Bradley University, both of, uh, from Peoria, Illinois, both of whom um, had, um, whose teams were still segregated. Basketball teams were all white. So it's really incredible story. And uh, even if you haven't read the book yet, you should come to the talk. And then um, the next day on Thursday, we have Esther Safran Foer, um, uh, who is talking about her memoir. I want you to know we're still here. I think that's what it's called. Um, and Miss Saffron Four wrote a really moving memoir about her family who escaped from um, the shtetl and I think it's the U Ukraine. Uh, Marsha, am I right? Ukraine. Yes, and, uh, and the, the story of the shtetl was the inspiration for her son, Jonathan Saffron Foyer's book, Everything is Illuminated, which he then had made into a movie. Um, so 
Uh, anyway, sh the book is really, really interesting, and um, it should be really interesting to, to hear her talk. And that's a lunch and learn. It's at noon on Thursday. So we hope that you can uh, join us next week is a very busy week in our community, as it turns out. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you. And, you know, like I said, look forward, look, look also for more information about uh, the follow up to this, to this incredible conversation with Rabbi Geller, um, not only on how to buy her book, how to, you know, find her website, but also for how we can continue this conversation. Friends, please stay safe. If anyone's having still um, needs, you know, as we get more information about vaccination, um, we will continue to try to help you. Um, we want to know what's going on with you. If any of you need anything, um, always know you can reach out to us and we will be here for you. So have a great night, everyone, and stay in touch. Thank you again, Rabbi. Thank you so, so much.